as we start the last two lectures, uh, we're going to focus this lecture really on um, one of the major roots in positive psychology, that of prevention and wellness. And when we think of prevention, we can really think of prevention sort of in two ways. Uh, primary preven uh, prevention is when you actually uh, act in a way to try and um, alleviate a problem that, that's likely to occur uh, before there is any evidence that, that um, the, uh, the problem has actually occurred. And basically secondary uh, prevention is when you um, try and fix something that's already occurred. And we can really see that in um, the major goal of this lecture is looking at both primary and secondary prevention and enhancement. And in many ways what we're going to see uh, in this lecture and really the very last lecture is sort of the application of so much of what we've talked about already um, in positive psychology. So in this case we're looking at uh, primary prevention uh, which is really stopping the bad before it happens or you know most um, uh, Definitionally, uh, actions intended to stop physical or psychological problems before they appear. Uh, and that's going to be compared to, in the first half of the lecture, secondary prevention or uh, with really um, a, a focus on uh, psychotherapy, which is sort of fixing the problems or actions to lessen or eliminate problems after they've actually already appeared. In the second half of the lecture, we'll really look at uh, primary enhancement, uh, which is trying to sort of, again, move from sort of functioning uh, to feeling pleasure and satisfaction, and then secondary enhancement, which is really trying to, to work at the sort of highest uh, peak experiences, uh, optimal life, uh, well-being. Um, so primary prevention, uh, as sort of we just mentioned, um, involves the interaction, uh, the interventions to stop physical or psychological problems before they, they occur. Um, they really are uh, trying to uh, remove or reduce the likelihood of any sort of psychological or physical difficulties before they occur. Um, most of what we're going to look at um, is actually focusing in on um, uh, sort of government interventions uh, that is going to try and increase the likelihood um, that success will occur uh, through legislation, uh, particularly in, um, in education uh, and, in, um, um, uh, and in the workplace. So there's two types of prevention that you can sort of work through on the primary side. A universal prevention when you're really looking at um, trying to uh, aim the prevention at the entire community. Um, there's no one group that is, is selected. Uh, so you know if we're looking at um, prevention that is uh, universal, um, we're really going to be thinking of like childhood immunizations. There's a nice example of a universal prevention, uh, sort of as we'll as we'll see later. There's also second uh, selective preventions, which is when you really focus on a particular at-risk group uh, population, uh, so uh, low birth weight children, or or really sort of any type of um, uh, group that you know to be at risk. Um, so primary preventions have been proven to be quite effective. Um, uh, what we've seen is that uh, children and <clears throat> adolescents who participate in prevention programs um, are uh, anywhere from 59 to 82 percent um, better uh, in terms of having reduced um, behavioral or psychosocial problems or and or increased competencies than those who were still at risk but weren't able to take part in this type of prevention. Um, and so when we look at some of these active ingredients of what makes some of these primary prevention programs uh, so uh, effective, um, and we'll see this really in Head Start, the inclusion of parents uh, is incredibly important. Um, trying to, and this will be a major focus through most of the uh, prevention and enhancement, um, increasing uh, interpersonal interactions, particularly really good interpersonal interactions, and using strong cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, these are really type, the types of uh, ingredients that are going to increase the likelihood um, that um, children will, will succeed, uh, will avoid the problems that you're trying to head off, um, or uh, will increase the competencies to reduce the likelihood that they will experience them. So Head Start's a, a sort of classic example. It's a government-sponsored program that provides poor children um, with a, a level of preparation that's equivalent to sort of the more uh, economically advantaged uh, children. Um, this is essentially the, the classic quintessential primary uh, prevention 
um, you know, uh, really um, was uh, spearheaded in the 60s um, to try and uh, bring in the entire family unit um, to work on sort of uh, low-income families with a comprehensive emotional, social, nutritional, psychological needs. Um, and it's been wildly successful. You see that children in the programs are, are better off at academic performance in sort of early grade school um, than those that, that did not um, take part in, in um, uh, Head Start. Uh, and, and quite interestingly, um, one of the parts that's is especially effective um, is the parental education side. And so you actually see that um, the parental education component um, really helps um, uh, the, the children, you know, through the indirect effect of increasing the competencies of, of the parents. Um, Henry Ford's got a great quote here. He says, more, uh, most people spend more time and energy trying to go around a problem than trying to solve it. And so when we think of secondary prevention, we're really trying to think about, uh, unfortunately, no matter how much primary prevention you actually have, eventually you're going to, to see that um, some problems are still going to need to be addressed after they've sort of unfolded. So these are, again, the actions that, that are taken after a problem has appeared. Um, really, again, the one that we're going to focus in on most for the next few minutes is, is psychotherapy. It's really what the book looks at. And when people come to psychotherapy, they know that they have a specific problem that is beyond their capabilities, and that's really what they're due to is to, is to attain that level of help. Um, psychotherapy, so again, the, the problem has manifested as some sort of uh, mental disorder or mental illness or even um, just a, a hassle or a life stressor. Um, most uh, the data out there really shows that psychotherapy is, is pretty effective. Um, there's a lot of evidence-based treatments out there. Um, individuals who have a, a psychological manifestation of, of an illness or a disorder, again, or of just a, a hassle or a stressor, um, who go to psychotherapy are 34% better off um, than those who don't. There's a lot of complexity here because you have to, um, you know, the effectiveness of the therapist is one of the greatest and most important determinants in how effective therapy is actually going to be, um, but that's based on client satisfaction reports. There's a lot of uh, cultural differences and what it means to be an effective therapist, and, and so um, that 34% actually maybe is a small underestimate. Um, what makes psychotherapy um, universally so um, successful is the suggestion that uh, hope therapy, even if it wasn't called that, has really been in um, the the background of, of sort of all of this. Um, so um, uh, different types of psychotherapies are you know are sort of using hope you know interventions, um, even if they're not actually calling them that. Um, so you know really how does uh, hope therapy work? Um, well, you 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 know if you're the clinician, you're probing a client for the different types of goals that they have. Um, and then you try and show them different types of pathways um, if there's sort of a blockage or if there's something that is um, you know, preventing a person from making progress on their goal. And you have this um, facilitation of sort of successful outcomes in psychotherapy so that a person has multiple pathways to get to their goal and has sort of the competency and the agency to, to sort of um, pursue these these types of, of goals in a goal-directed uh, way. Um, part of what's really the sort of overarching goal of therapy is to teach clients um, sort of how to attain their life goals, especially when they're encountering um, sort of blockages or different types of um, uh, barriers that is going to prevent them from actually having um, sort of successful um, goal-directed behaviors. Um, so again, a, a way of sort of doing a compare and contrast here. So, so a lot of psychotherapy uses problem talk instead of solution talk to try and reduce psychological symptoms. Um, but solution-focused therapy is really you know, trying to ask the client specifically what they want to achieve through therapy rather than really focusing on the problems that they, that they may be trying to sort of reduce. And then hope therapy sort of builds on um, a solution talk by, by trying to build up a person's um, uh, strengths, sort of teach them how to develop their strengths, uh, and then use those strengths to make pathways to the goals um, that they're um, most trying to accomplish. Uh, unfortunately, um, if we sort of look at prevention and, and enhancement, um, on sort of a you know, quick example, uh, depression is one of the most frequent problems uh, facing older individuals. That's not 
um, a, a typical part of the aging process and, and we'll pick up here in the, in the second half of the lecture.